What do you wonder? <laughs> That's good. I thought it was going to be super specific and I was going to be way not ready to answer. That, that's a good question. What do I wonder? I consider myself a really curious person. I like um, learning things. Um, I just went back to school actually for that reason. I wonder about like the seasons and how like the trees can like change colors. I wonder how things work a lot of times. Wondering in a way that brings me a sense of awe is something that also brings me a lot of joy. Um, I think I wonder about religion. I wonder how we can hear God. When I wonder about God, I wonder if we would laugh together, if we would sing or tell jokes, um, and just kind of what our interaction would be when we first meet each other. What do you wonder? What do you wonder? I wonder um, why it's so difficult to do the healthy thing when I'm so concerned about my health. You ever wonder about that? Why is that so difficult? That just is insane. Some of you, um, you're wondering, is it true that Netflix is gonna wait, make you wait until Halloween for Stranger Things, for the next uh, season of Stranger Things? Yeah, you're wondering about that, you know? Those of us who believe in God, we, we wonder about heaven, don't we? We wonder what it's gonna be like. We wonder, are we really gonna see the people we love? Are they gonna look the same? Are we gonna be able to meet famous people? Will my mom um, be the younger version of my mom or the middle-aged version of my mom? Or will she be the mom that, that I saw last? I mean, how does all that work? We wonder about heaven. If you're a non-theist, you wonder how we could be so naive as to believe there is a place called heaven. And how is it that we continue to hold on to these myths that you know, should have been let go generations ago. But at the same time, if you're a non-theist, you, you wonder about life after death, don't you? you? You wonder if there's something else. And when you lose a loved one, you, you can't help but wonder, is there more? And we all wonder through a frame of reference and the frame of reference is inadequate because the frame of reference doesn't provide us with all the answers and all the information that we need. But there's another reason we wonder as well. We talked about this last time. We wonder because our frame of reference isn't clear. Our, our frame of reference is cluttered with life. Our frame of reference is cluttered with our personal life experiences. And we wanna think we're better than this, don't we? We wanna think we're smarter than this. We wanna think that we've moved beyond this. We, we wanna think that the pain in our lives doesn't impact the way that we see the world, that somehow we've moved beyond that. But that's virtually impossible. And the way that you see the world is impacted by your childhood, whether it was a great childhood or a not so great childhood, the truth is that's a filter through which you view the world, through which you interpret relationships. And then there's those fears and those insecurities and those things that just don't ever quite go away and it becomes a part of a filter. And all of these things create a filter through which we see the world. And so we wonder, but we don't simply wonder through a frame of reference with limited information. We wonder through a frame of reference that's full of life experiences. Now, Christians believe something that's a little bit odd. That's why we're talking about it. Christians believe that God actually became one of us to clarify these things for us, that God actually became one of us so that we could understand, so that we could see more clearly that he sent someone to our side of the frame to serve as a reference. So in spite of all the things that we can't know, in spite of all the things that we will never know, that we could know where we stood with him. And so for the last couple of weeks, we've looked at this, this little phrase, this, this verse from, written in the first century by a, a, somebody who was writing specifically to Jewish people in the first century in this, this document, it's called Hebrews. It's called the book of Hebrews, but it's not really a book. It's really like a long sermon. And first century Christians found this to be so valuable they, valuable, they copied it and they distributed it. And eventually it made it into our Christian Bible our New Testament. And in, this, this art, in, 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 in his, uh, his attempt to reach out to Jewish people in his community who had put their faith in Jesus, but were beginning to wander away, 
he made this powerful, powerful observation. Here, here, here's what he said. He said, we're to fix our eyes on Jesus. We're to fix our eyes on Jesus, who is the pioneer, the one that started it all off and the perfecter of our faith. He said, there's gonna be a lot of things that distract you. There are gonna be a lot of things you don't ever know. There are gonna be a lot of life experiences that don't add up, but we are to fix our eyes on the person of Jesus. Not church, not our church experience, not necessarily the things that happened to us or the things that didn't happen for us in life, but to fix our eyes on Jesus. So if you've wandered away, if you wandered and then you wandered away, or as we said last time, if you're sort of reaching for the door of faith, You've been inside, you grew up inside. In fact, you may serve at a church, you may work at a church, you may be the pastor of a church, and you find just about impossible to continue believing. If you're reaching for the door, isn't it true? The problem really isn't Jesus. And so the question we've asked, and the question I wanna ask one more time is this, what was the faith? What was the faith you've lost, fixed on, or fastened to? Or what is the faith you are losing What is the faith that is slowly slipping away, fixed on or fastened to? And as we approach the Christmas season, I wanna encourage you, I wanna plead with you, as we approach this, we basically have one more week before Christmas, would you spend some time refastening or fixing your eyes on Jesus? Not church, not Christians, not your pastor, not necessarily the way that you were raised, not necessarily what you were taught, but would you fix your eyes on the person of Jesus? Jesus. Now, today, as we continue the discussion, I, I wanna address one obstacle that may stand in the way of you doing that, especially if you've stepped outside of faith and you think the whole idea of stepping back in or even considering or reconsidering, if it, that just seems like it's just unimaginable to you. Perhaps this is one of the reasons you find that so difficult. Because the assumption is, and these aren't your words, these are words perhaps I put around one of your thoughts. The assumption is this, that Christianity requires mind-numbing, experience-denying faith. And faith becomes the problem. That to be a Christian, to step back inside this whole idea, to consider Jesus or to stay in this box that you feel like has become a box of religion or Christianity, it requires you to have mind numbing that is, there are things I just can't look at, there are things I can't look at too carefully, there are things I just can glance at, but if I focus on them too much, it's gonna erode my faith. Mind numbing, experience denying, I just have to pretend that doesn't happen in the world. I have to pretend that didn't happen to me. I have to pretend that didn't happen to my best friend. I have to pretend that didn't happen to my sister. Mind numbing, experience denying faith. Here's what I want you to know. That the original version did not. That Jesus' original followers did not pretend things were better than they were. And Jesus' original followers were never asked by Jesus not to look, to pretend, or just to believe and belief. In fact, last week, if you were here in part two of this series, Jesus actually said to his followers, he said, guys, if you're having a hard time believing me, then don't believe me. Believe based on what you've seen. Believe based on what you've experienced. Believe based on the works themselves. And the reason this is so confusing sometimes, and the reason sometimes the assumption is that in order to follow Jesus or to fix our eyes on Jesus, we just can't look too carefully at the reality of the world around us, is because there's so much misunderstanding about this word, faith. So today, I wanna talk specifically about this. And the reason it's so confusing, I'll own this, is because guys like me, men and women like me, pastors and church leaders have made faith complicated and they've made faith confusing. And our, by creating confusion around faith, we are responsible for causing some people to wander away from the faith. And I think the church oftentimes is responsible for causing some people to never even consider faith. So what is faith? And what's the role, as it, especially as it relates to Christianity? So a couple of things it's not. First, uh, because perhaps you heard this growing up, um, faith is not some sort of force and it's not some sort of power. Faith isn't some sort of invisible lasso that we get around God's neck. And if we have enough faith, and if enough people have enough faith, we can get God to do things that God wasn't planning on doing. And perhaps the church that you were raised in taught that. And perhaps that's one of the reasons you walked away because you believed and believed and believed and you prayed and you prayed and you prayed and the pastor came over and prayed for your mom or for your sister or came to the hospital and everybody prayed and everybody believed and everybody had extraordinary faith. And they prayed powerful prayers, loud prayers. And God didn't answer them. And so as God didn't answer your prayers, you begin to wonder, is there a God that can be trusted? Is there a God at all? That faith is not a power or a force we tap into. Do you know what that is? That's called magic. That's called 
paganism. That is not Christian or Jewish faith. And faith is not a formula. Faith is not something you have to figure out. There's not a pen code. There's not a code that somebody, you get the code and then God starts spitting stuff out. If you figure this out, it's not something that's deep and only deep people understand it and you've got to listen a long time and attend a long time and you know stand a certain way or kneel a certain way. It's not complicated. It's not something you figure out. It's not a formula. In fact, the author of Hebrews, the very person that has invited you and invited me to fix our eyes on Jesus and to unfix our eyes on everything else, actually gives us the definition for faith. Now, here's the, ma- the amazing thing. Many of us who, who grew up in church have actually heard what I'm about to explain or hear the verses I'm about to teach taught before. And this is the most amazing and confusing thing to me. I've heard pastors teach what I'm about to teach or teach the verses I'm about to teach. And the goal of the author of Hebrews is to make faith clear and understandable. And by the time they finish talking about what the author of Hebrews wrote, it is less clear and it is more confusing. And they actually use these verses to convince people that faith is something very different than what the author of Hebrews says it is. And the author of Hebrews says that faith is simple and faith is central, but here's the big deal. Faith is not the reason we follow Jesus. Here's what he writes, he says this. Now faith is, so he's about to give us a definition. Now he's a Jewish man, probably a Jewish man, writing to a Jewish Christian audience. And so this is the Jewish and the Christian understanding of what faith is. Now faith is, here it is, now faith is confidence in what we hope for. Now he's introduced another word. Now what is hope? Hope is wanting something to be with no guarantee. That's what hope is. Wanting something to be, but there's no guarantee. You hope to get a raise. You hope to get a bonus. You hope to get married. Heck, you hope to get a date, right? So faith happens, this is important. Faith happens or faith is developed or suddenly there's faith. Faith happens when hope so becomes confident something will be so. That faith becomes a reality when hope so moves to confidence that something will be so. But that leads us to another question and that's this. What what makes us confident hope so will be so. In other words, what has to happen for a hope so to be a be so? What has to happen inside us or around us so that something we hope will happen, suddenly we have absolute confidence that it absolutely will happen. So the author of Hebrews then asks the, basically makes the same statement a second way. He says this, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and it's assurance about what we do not see. So once again, we're asking this question. Okay, I believe what you're saying, but how do we get from hope so to assurance? How do we get from, I don't see it, but I'm absolutely sure I'm going to see it. And the answer is so simple. He doesn't even give us the answer because everybody knows the answer to this question. Let me help you, you know, surface the answer for yourself. How will you know that you got the raise? When your boss walks in the office and says, I bet you've been hoping for a raise. The good news is I'm giving you a raise. And when your boss promises you a raise, hope goes to faith. You go home and you don't say, honey, I hope I'm getting a raise. You don't say to your roommate, good news, I hope I'm getting a raise. No, you go home to your roommate or your spouse and you say, I know for certain I'm getting a raise. How do you know? My boss told me so, he or she promised me so. The reason you know you're gonna get a bonus is because somebody tells you you're gonna get a bonus. And once they tell you, once they confirm it, then hope becomes faith. Suddenly there's the assurance that something's actually gonna happen. There has to be a promise. You hope she'll go out with you. You hope and hope and hope, and suddenly you get that text. Sounds great, 7.30 works for me. Now hope so to believe so, and you go home and say, she said yes, he said yes. So this is so clear, this is so simple, and I don't know why Christians make it so complicated and pastors make it so complicated, but as we're gonna see, this is one of the reasons for many people it's difficult to stay inside of faith, and it's so difficult sometimes to get people to reconsider faith because of the way the church has talked about faith. So let's go back to the text. So faith is confidence that God is and will do what he promised to do. This is basically the working definition of faith. That faith is confidence that God is and he'll do what he promised to do. Now, this is very important for our discussion. We do not believe that God is because of faith. And we do not believe that God keeps God's promises because of of faith. Faith is confidence that God is. And the reason we believe God is, is not because of faith. We believe God is because of evidence. And as we're going to see in just a few minutes, we don't believe God keeps his promises just because of faith. 
We believe God keeps his promises because God has kept his promises as we are about to see. So faith is very simple. Faith is simply God, with confidence that God is and that he will do what he has promised to do. So back to our text, here's, here's what the author says. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and it's assurance about what we do not see. And everybody reading this is like, that's exactly right. And you get the assurance once you get the promise. We know that. This, the author continues, this, this kind of faith. And then he gives us a whole bunch of illustrations. This is what the ancients were commended for. Now, if you read this text by yourself and, and it's, it's a powerful text, at this point, the author goes into a long list of what we're gonna call the heroes of Judaism, or he calls them the ancients. And these were Jewish people reading this, so they knew all of these stories. So instead of teasing out all these stories, he just goes right through this list of people, some we've heard of and some we've not. And then for all of them, he says, they, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. And what does he say? He says, these, each of these people were given a promise and they lived as if God existed and that God would keep that promise. That's what it means to live by faith. One of the ones he talks about is somebody we, most of us have heard of, Abraham. Just a quick survey. And if you're watching from home, I want you to participate. I know this is kind of clunky, but if you've heard of Abraham before you came today or before you turned on the television, would you raise your hand if you've heard of Abraham before? Yeah, you heard of him. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Okay, so one of the folks he talks about is Abraham and he says, Abraham left home. Why did Abraham leave home? What is, his, what is it, his mom's cooking? You know, his brother kept wearing his clothes. You know, why did Abraham leave home? He left home because God said, I want you to leave home and I'm gonna show you a place that you don't know of. So Abraham believed God's promise and he acted on that promise. That's what faith is. He talked about a guy many of us heard about growing up in church, a guy named Gideon. Gideon has the original 300 story. He did not defend a pass in Thermopylae you know, against the Persians. This was the original story of the 300. Um, Gideon with 300 men about a thousand years before the Greeks and the Persians were at war with each other. Gideon took 300 men and in the middle of the night, charged down into a valley filled with Midianites. It was about a 200 to one ratio. And he routed this army and delivered his nation. And do you know why he charged down into this valley against a foe that was, he was so outnumbered it was ridiculous? Well, it wasn't because he wanted people to write great songs about him. It wasn't because he was crazy. It's because God said, Gideon, this is what I want you to do and I promise you will be victorious. And Gideon acted on God's promise. That's what it means to live by faith. Then we've all, most of us, probably all of us have heard of Moses. Moses left Egypt as a fugitive. Moses left Egypt with a price on his head. And we all know the story. Moses went back to Egypt. Now, why in the world would someone go back to the place that they barely escaped with their life from? Why would he do that? Because God said to Moses, I want you to go back. And if you'll go back, I promise I'm gonna use you to deliver your people from Egyptian bondage. So faith is simple. Faith is believing God is based on evidence, not based on faith. And faith is believing that God will keep his promises, not based on faith, but based on the fact that we know God keeps God's promises. Now here's the cool part. And here's why I'm going on and on about this. All of these heroes of the faith that he lists, all of these, you know, the, the ancients as he talks to them, talks about them, all of these ancients were commended by responding to God's promise, but all of them, all of them believed in God's global promise for the world because God spoke to Abraham about 2,000 years before Jesus shows up. This is amazing. About 2,000 years before Jesus shows up, God speaks to Abraham and God made Abraham a promise. And all of these characters in the Jewish scripture, they knew God's promise to Abraham and they lived their lives not only in light of God's personal promise to them, they lived their lives in, God, in light of God's global promise to the world. And here's what God said to Abraham about 2,000 years before the time of Jesus. This is amazing. He said, I will talk into Abraham. I will make you into a great nation. Now, let me ask you a quiz a question. Okay. This is a Bible question, but everybody knows the answer. Did Abraham eventually become a nation? It's not a trick question. Did Abraham eventually become a nation? Yes. In fact, Abraham eventually became several nations. So this actually happened. And here's something fascinating. I'm guessing probably nobody in the room or nobody watching can name a single person that eventually became a nation other than Abraham. Wow. Promise. Put a check by that one. And I will bless you. Well, I'm thinking if you become a nation, you can consider yourself blessed. What did you do? Well, I, I became a nation. Oh, huh, wow. That's cool. I, I will make your name great. This is why I asked you to raise your hand a minute ago. I will make your name great. 4,000 years ago. 
God tells a guy out in the desert, I'm gonna make your name great. 4,000 years later, halfway around the world, just about everybody in this room and watching knows who Abraham is. I think God made Abraham's name great. You knew his name before you got here. Wow, yeah. And then, he, and that's, not, that's, just, that's just the warm-up act. I mean, he hasn't even got to the big one yet. This is, this is the one that all the ancients lived in light of. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Oh, what, what, do you, what does that mean? And then you ready? This, this is phenomenal. And all peoples, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, when God made this promise to Abraham, this didn't make any sense because people didn't bless people. Uh, tribes didn't bless tribes. Nations didn't bless nations. Nations didn't, not only did nations not bless other nations, nations conquered, pillaged, and enslaved other nations. That's what you did to your neighbors. You took everything they had of value so you'd have more value, right? That's, that's what you did. And God says, no, something new is going to happen. And Abraham, I'm going to turn you into a nation. And your nation is not simply gonna bless the surrounding tribes and families. Your nation is going to bless the entire earth. And my friends, that's the story of Christmas. Jesus being born into this, onto this planet in the little town of Bethlehem was the fulfillment of a promise made 2,000 years ago. And all over the world today, all over the world today, people are gathering in the name of Jesus and Jesus' followers consider themselves blessed. God, God fulfilled this promise to Abraham. Now, back to the author of Hebrews. Here's what he says about this, because again, this is during the time right after Jesus had been crucified and rose from the dead. Here's, here's what he said about these ancient Jewish people that were looking forward to this promise. All these people, talking about you know everybody after Abraham all the way up through the Old Testament, all of these people were still living by faith. This is such a cool phrase. All of these people were still living by faith when they died. All of these people were still living by faith when they died. What does that mean? That all of these people believed God was going to do something for the world through Abraham, but they didn't get to see it happen. They died before it happened, but they lived by faith. Every day of their lives, just about, they made decisions based on the fact that God is, God keeps his promises. God kept his promise to them personally. And one day, someday, in a way we can't even begin to imagine, God is going to bless the world through our father, Abraham. Now, switching gears a little bit. Here's the reason this is so important as we approach Christmas, that both in the Jewish scriptures and in the New Testament scriptures, nobody assumed, nobody assumed they could faith God into or talk God into anything. Nobody used faith as magic. Nobody used faith as leverage. People believed that God was God and that God could not be manipulated, that God was to be worshiped, but God could be trusted. That's the definition. That was the operating, the working definition of faith, that God is who God says he is. God keeps his promises. And the people in the old, in the Jewish scripture and the Christian scripture, they just live their lives in light of that. In fact, one of the, my favorite little instances in the life of Jesus, now fast forwarding a little bit from the time of Abraham, uh, Jesus is going along with his guys. And, and the scripture tells us, and we can't imagine this, that a man covered in leprosy, and, and, and probably none of us have, have actually seen someone with leprosy. Maybe, maybe a few of you've traveled to certain parts of the world, but a man covered in leprosy, this is a man who has no family, has no life, who has to warn people when he's close by. People were scared to death of this horrible disease. A man covered with leprosy approaches Jesus, which was so difficult for him to do, and he falls down at Jesus' feet. And he makes this statement, and I just think this is so precious, this is so powerful. This is, this is an example of perfect faith. You ready? Here's what he said. Lord, which was a title of respect. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Not, Lord, I believe you will, I believe you will, I believe you will, I believe you will. My friends are back home praying, we believe you will, we believe you will. No, that's presumption. Lord, I have perfect faith. Don't miss this. I have perfect faith that if you are willing, you can. And why would a leper be absolutely confident that Jesus could heal him? And the answer is because he knew Jesus had healed other people. He did not go to Jesus because of faith. He went to Jesus because of evidence and because of what he'd seen, because of what he heard. He was absolutely confident 
that Jesus could do for him what he needed done. And I love what Jesus says. I love this. Jesus reached out his hand. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. This drove religious leaders crazy. You are not supposed to touch unclean things. And the amazing thing in the New Testament is this, that when Jesus touched unclean people, Jesus didn't acquire their disease. The opposite happened. They were healed. Jesus reached out and touched the man, and I love this, and he said, I am willing. In other words, that's all the faith I'm looking for. Not faith that you know I will, simply faith that you know I can. That is Jewish. That is Christian faith. Now, the problem is, if, if you're raised like a lot of people, you are not taught this definition of faith. You were taught that faith is more like a force, it's a power, it's some way you get God to do something. I mean, it's kind of spooky and, and you know, maybe some crazy things happen in your church. And people resist this simple definition of faith. And I'll tell you why they resist it. And I'll tell you why preachers resist it. And I'll tell you why Christians resist it sometimes. Because it leaves God in control. So I have some good news for you. God is in control. And I'm so glad God did not listen to or answer my 16-year-old prayers. I would have had a Porsche. That would have been the end of me, right? And aren't you glad God didn't listen to some of your prayers? But at the same time, the reason you walked away is because God didn't answer some legitimate prayers. Isn't that right? The problem with this view of faith is that it leaves God in control, but like the pagans of old times, we want the gods to do our bidding. That's why I said it's paganism, it's magic. Anytime we think we can do something here to get almighty God to do something almighty God isn't planning to do, that's not Christianity. That's not even good Judaism, that's magic. And then when God doesn't answer our prayer, when God doesn't come through, when things don't work out the way we were told it'll work out if we had enough faith, if we prayed hard enough, if we were good little girls and boys, we lose faith. But we lose a faith that was founded on and based on something it was never to be based on to begin with. Now, here's why this is such a big deal to me personally. And this is why it's such a big deal to our churches. And this is why it should be a big deal to parents. And this is why it should be a big deal to those of you who've walked away from faith. A generation, an entire generation is abandoning faith because the church and people like me, but because the church has signed God's name to promises God never made. So no wonder your faith fell apart. No wonder the whole thing crumbled. No wonder you couldn't maintain confidence in God. You were, you were holding God accountable or people taught you to hold God accountable to things God never promised to do. So if you grew up with vending machine God, the vending machine version of God, if you put in enough money and you put in enough time, you put in enough camps, you put in enough prayer, you put in enough Bible reading, you know, something good's gonna come out. Or if you were raised on the, the bad things never happen to good people, you know, version of faith, of course you lost faith. That's not even Christian faith. That has nothing to do with the foundation of our faith. God never promised any of those things. But here's the fabulous news. God did not demonstrate his love for you. And God did not demonstrate his concern for you by promising nothing bad would happen. He did not demonstrate his love and concern for you by promising that every illness would be healed. And he did not demonstrate his love and concern for you by promising a flawless, perfect book. God's promise, God's promise is far more full of wonder than any of those things. God's promise to you is more wonderful than any of those things. The apostle Paul who hated Christians, the apostle Paul whose life mission was to stamp out the church in the first century, the apostle Paul who eventually became a follower of Jesus and wrote letters that became part of our New Testament. The apostle Paul said it this way, it's perfect. He said, but God demonstrates, that is God put on a demonstration. God put on a demonstration to demonstrate his love for you and it had nothing to do with making sure everything worked out for you and everything worked out for me. He did something way bigger than that. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, and the reason this was present tense for the apostle Paul is that he was alive when Jesus died. So this is very personal to him. He was saying, while I was still a sinner, well, I was still creating a whole lot of this. Well, I was still responding negatively and poorly to a whole lot of this. While I was trying to overcome some of this, well, I was still present tense a sinner or the way that he would write it for us. While you were still a sinner, while you were making decisions that you knew were contrary perhaps to God's will or perhaps you made decisions and you didn't know anything about God's will. While you were still a sinner, 
The fact that God knew that you would live and knew that you would sin, God went ahead in any way, went ahead anyway, and he sent his son to die for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. This is the point. The trustworthiness, the wonderfulness, the trustworthiness, the wonderfulness of God was settled at the cross, not at an answered prayer. He came to our side of the window so that the one thing we would never have to worry about and wonder about was his love for us. Now, that's the message, that's the gospel, that's the point, that's the invitation. That's why regardless of what you've believed and regardless of what happened, there's always a time and it's always appropriate for you to unfocus on some things and maybe some things that happened or didn't happen or you were promised that didn't come through and to refocus your attention on Jesus. This is the wonder that we should never ever lose. The wonder demonstrated at the cross, the wonder of his love. And here's, here's the reason I just wanna be as emphatic as I possibly can. The ancients, the ancients, they looked forward and believed. We are on the other side of God fulfilling the big one, of God fulfilling the extraordinary one, the God, the God fulfilling his promise to Abraham that I'm going to bless the nations through you, Abraham. And we are on the other side of that. And it is undeniable. It is unmistakably true. The, the, the evidence is, is, is not just built up and mounted. The evidence is overwhelming. God kept that, that promise. That's why a third of the world's population actually believes that Jesus is divine and came from God. This is exactly what God promised would happen to Abraham and through Abraham. He kept his promise to the world and he kept his promise to you. So all of us, whether you're inside, outside, all of us, whether you're on the outside and wishing there was a way to get back in, whether you're on the inside and leaning out, all of us have been invited to do the one thing we should always do, to simply fix our eyes on Jesus. Because, not because of faith, because he has provided us with enough evidence to believe while our minds continue to catch up with the wonder of this world, the wonder of creation. There will be a lot of things we don't ever know, but where we stand with God is something we never have to wonder about. Fun fact, while I've been talking, you know, while we've been together here, while you've been watching, did you know that your body killed off over 2.8 billion cells? You know that? Did you know that while I was talking, not only did your body, yeah, we changed the subject. Yeah, did you know that not only did your body kill, you know, over 2.8 billion cells, did you know that some healthy ones divided and replaced most of those cells? And you know what's amazing? With no conscious effort on your part. That and things like that should fill you with wonder. So here's the question, last time I'm, gonna get to ask it for a while. What, what, what do you wonder? What do you wonder? And with all that we don't know, and with all that we will never know, 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, a little light broke through in the little town of Bethlehem. In a world yet to make the connection between germs and disease, God spoke in terms that all of us in every single generation could understand. He showed up on our side of the frame to serve as a reference. He showed up on our side to demonstrate that he was in fact on our side. And I love this text, and I know I've, I've read it to you before, but I just love it because of who wrote it, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. He outlived all of his friends. I've told you this before. He lived through a chaotic, chaotic, chaotic time when he saw the whole city of Jerusalem destroyed and people carted, friends of his carted off into slavery. Thousands of Jewish people killed by the Romans. The temple destroyed, never to be resurrected, never to be rebuilt. And yet with all that bloodshed, with all that terror, with all that experience, John, looking back, not looking back on his religious experience, not looking back on his schooling, not looking back on his sin, looking back at his time with Jesus, concluded this. In him, in spite of everything going on around, in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. 
kind. And the light shines, and oh, this was so literal for him. The light shines in the darkness, and the world was so dark. And the darkness has not overcome or overwhelmed it. It didn't then, and it hasn't now. So, if you've wondered, and then because of some of this, you wandered, here's the last thing I would ask you to ponder. There will always, there will always, there will always, there will always be things that you wonder about. But God's love for you should never, ever be one of those things. And it won't be if you'll take your eyes off the people, the institutions, the hurt, and the broken promises, the things that have caused you over time to lose faith. And if you will fix your eyes on Jesus, and the wonder of his love for you.